Hi, everyone. Uh, for those that just jumped on, we're going to give it another minute or two uh, before we get started. We do know that there are a few folks um, that are still jumping on. Thank you for your patience. All right, everyone. Thank you again for joining us for uh, this webinar that is titled Attack Simulation, What is Your Strategy? Today we're joined by Stephanie Kurtz of Trace3, as well as Scott Register of Keysight. Together they're going to be presenting to you a very insightful discussion. Um, so with no further ado, I'm gonna pass it on over to Stephanie. Thank you so much. And I'd like to welcome Scott Register, who's the Vice President of Solutions at Keysight Technologies. Um, the interesting thing about Scott is he's got over more, more than 15 years of leading product management and go-to-market uh, experience in global technology companies. So he brings a huge amount of just great experience to the conversation. At Keysight, he was asked to bring new solution technologies to market and to broaden the, the Keysight portfolio. He brings experience in the inevitable growth across a diverse range of environments. Um, and so when we look at his strong history of success and engagement with customers, um, channel business partners on a global basis. And so when we look at um, the threat landscape, it's changing so very rapidly. It's critical to have a, a layered defense strategy and a defense with fraud and email compromise ransomware and exfiltration of organizational data is on the rise and organizations have to stay diligent. When we look at denial of service attacks, for example, in 2020, more than 10 million attacks occurred and more than 1.6 million attacks than the prior year. When we look at things like threats where uh, data and um, different types of information was leaked, um, it is in a sharp increase. When we looked at data from 2020, we saw about 8.7%. And when we moved to 2021, that same data exfiltration increased 81% in that quarter in the following year. So threats internally, externally, leaked data, exfiltrated data, I've seen sharp increases. And so when we look at how to understand how our environment is secure, how do we really Prior director of cybersecurity, that was always my question. Do we have some type of internal myopia going on? And how do we know that our environment is really secure? The challenge is, is we think we all are secure. So Scott, when we talk about environments today, what's missing in most organizations threat and vulnerability strategy? So uh, th thanks. Thanks for that uh, in info um, or in in intro. It was uh, uh, yeah. So what what's missing? Um, I think a lot of the times, and this is frankly, I've been on you know sort of the vendor side and in a lot of roles selling defensive technology and things like that in the in the past. Uh, I think very often we tend to take a very sort of product and technology first view. You know, we 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 see all these kind of new and emerging threats out there. And naturally we sort of seek out, oh, what's the way to stop this one and this one and this one. And we end up buying and deploying lots and lots of products, often dozens, you know, of kind of point security solutions, all of which are are good. I mean, there, there's actually, you know, I've been in the security test business now for you know, well over a, a decade. Most of the security products out there are actually pretty good. So the problem 
the, the you know what leads to breaches is typically not a technology deficit. Um, it's more configuration management and just dealing, frankly, with the sheer complexity of having all these dozens of security products, all of which have to be kind of configured correctly every day, all of which are generating, you know, tons of logs and sending up, up to your SIM. And then your analysts are sort of coping with, oh, my God, I've got all of these things. Which one is, is important? Right. I mean, that's the alert fatigue, right? We're, we're all uh, sort of familiar with that. So I think one of the big. Um, kind of gaps is not actually validating that those pieces we've put in place are actually working and that we're getting our money's worth out of them, right? Because what's the point in buying a great security solution if something about it isn't configured correctly or even if you aren't able to like understand <clears throat> when you get certain log messages from your EDR and your firewall and this and that, that it means this kind of attack is going on. So that that sort of validation and follow up step, which makes sure that you're getting the most out of the product and that your your security team, your your analysts are able to like use it effectively and sort of understand all the information that you're getting from it. So it's I, I think that's the big gap is that kind of test and validation piece and sort of continuous improvement and training. The technology is there, the products are there. But we're still getting breached, right? And and so it, it sort of goes back to, to that question. Great point there, where we talk about kind of that patchwork quilt of different solutions and how they overlap and the complexity of them. So what is exactly breach and attack simulation and, and what does that look like? Okay, so breach and attack simulation is where you're as realistically as possible, yet safely simulating an attack on your network. So typically this involves things like, um, you know, you've got sort of agents or software in your network, which are emulating users or endpoints or, or whatever that go through all of the stages of an attack, right? Like you can literally just sort of map, you know, Meyer framework onto an attack and step through all those, um, you know, or go through all those steps on your network. And so this lets you validate all of the sort of enforcement points, your firewall, your IDS or I, uh, you know, IPS, your endpoint or your WAF, if you're talking about web services, things like lateral movement, you know, can something go from one endpoint to another? Uh, and it's important that this is on your actual network, right? Um, you can do training and things like that in a, in a lab environment, which is great. And you can learn to use different products. You know, you might go to a firewall vendors training session or something like that. Nothing wrong with that, right? It's great to know how to use those, those products. But until you've seen what an attack looks like on your actual network, uh, and you've actually tried that attack, you're not really going to know if your kind of tools are all configured correctly. Uh, and if you're able to, like if your SIM, is set up correctly to say, oh, if this happens, this happens, this doesn't happen, this happens in five minutes, then that means X attack, right? And so it's that that process of sort of running a real attack safely on your network so that you can identify gaps in coverage and, you know, fixing things, you know, find out where your gaps are and, and fix those, and then you do it again, right? So you're, it's, the, it's a sort of a continuous improvement process. About running these breach and attack simulations on the network. You know, with COVID, we have remote users, we have the cloud, we have VPN. You know, where should breach and attack simulations be conducted from? Um, so anywhere you have sensitive digital assets, uh, you probably, or you, you should have protection there. So anywhere you have protection, of sensitive digital assets, you want to validate the security at that point, right? So if you're talking, so great example, users at home, right? Um, you have to worry now, not about, not just about sort of their endpoints, but whatever network they're on at home, is now sort of a part of your network, right? And so we've all, you know, we're all sitting around bored and we're shopping on Amazon and deploying, you know, smart plugs and smart switches and all these great, you know, kind of smart home devices which are basically little computers and they're not always the most secure devices in the world, right? There's, I won't pick on any, you know, vendor here, but 
quick Google search will show you lots of examples of um, you know, smart home devices that you can basically hop through and then get onto other devices on the network. And if someone's laptop is connected on the VPN, that's a great opportunity for something to move across the VPN back into your corporate network, right? As an example, so you wanna test those. Obviously your, you know, your data center, your kind of on-prem network, they're all sort of connecting uh, back to, and you know, may not have a lot of sort of oversight now because people aren't there. You absolutely wanna val validate the security there. We all know that, uh, and obviously the pandemic, if anything has sort of accelerated our move to cloud, right? Hey, nobody's in the data center anyway, we might as well yeah, move this stuff, right? So, um, and actually one of the things that, that we've seen in many cases is when, uh, you know, when our customers have moved from like a, you know, a data center with their traditional WAF, wh whoever the vendor is, you know, F5 and Perva, whoever, um, when they move to the cloud, they often don't take those sort of legacy um, web application firewalls with them, right? In many cases, the, the web providers are basically pushing their protection products on you. Well, configuring, you know, configuring a firewall is actually not often that that difficult, right? I mean, uh, you're basically restricting, you know, not not allowing anything inbound and then restricting, you know, kind of what people can do outbound so they don't go to bad spots. Spots. Web application firewalls can require really complex configuration. And so making sure that this new WAF that you don't have any experience with is actually set up correctly to protect your really, really valuable web assets. That's another place that you know you really want to validate the security, uh, but sort of often gets overlooked or people just don't have the tools available to uh, to validate that. So maybe a long answer, but anywhere you have important information or even access via lateral movement to important information, you have protections and you want to validate that protection. Well, I think you make a great point with COVID-19 and, and the continued remote worker challenges you know, having that visibility is so important. And so when we look at implementing attack simulation strategies, um, what visibility is really gained from deploying that type of strategy in your environment? Great question. Um, I think what you're really trying to understand and see is risk, right? What is your risk profile so that you can make intelligent decisions, right? If you want a perfectly secure network, you cut the cord, right? I mean, we, we all know this, right? And, and you know, although I spend a lot of time now on like wireless attacks, so even cutting the cord isn't, isn't gonna completely attack, uh, protect you. But basically you, you have to disconnect if you want it completely secure, but if you do that, you're not gonna get a lot of work done. So what we, you know, what IT security managers uh, have, to, have to make all the time are sort of trade-offs. What, do, what does my business require? What does the security require? And how do I balance those needs? So knowing that you'll never be 100% uh, secure, you want to be able to make intelligent, risk-driven, quantifiable decisions about where, you know, where is your risk? How much is it gonna cost you, both in terms of dollars and maybe business impact to mitigate those risks so that you can adjust where you want to be sort of on the curve based on your, your risk profile and, and your business. So what you're really trying to see is where are my exposures? What would it take to fix those? And then make an intelligent decision about that. I mean, we'd all like to pretend, oh yeah, we'll buy XYZ firewall, XDR, or whatever, and be 100% secure. Yeah, that ain't gonna happen. So here in the real world, how do we deal with that and make intelligent decisions, right? Well, and oftentimes um, the exposure situation, and individual organizations find out about this exposure through actually being breached. So as we look at yeah. this, as we look at this technology, you know, what exactly are we measuring? Is it the MITRE attack techniques that are in use? What, what's in use to measure kind of what this attack simulation strategy looks like? Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, MITRE itself isn't a measurement framework. Right. Although we and you know, many others like use the MITRE attack framework as sort of the, the lens through which you can view your exposure and say and say, okay, this is how different threat actors are behaving. 
ones that are going against you know finance or industrial or whatever and so i'm going to take those ttps uh and i'm going to apply those to my network to see how it responds end of the day i think what again what you're really measuring is risk right you've got you know critical and severe and medium and low uh impact um you know, kind of vulnerabilities in, in your network and you want to measure those, right? And basically apply a score and then track how you're changing over time, right? Um, one of the, it, it's surprising, you know, most parts of a business have really well-defined metrics. Sales, how many widgets did you sell this week? Marketing, how many leads did you generate? You know. I'll, manufacturing how many you know widgets did you build and what was your cost per widget it's really hard to do that for security traditionally right and in fact a lot of the the metrics that we have are actually fairly painful right like how many breaches did you know about last year well that's like a terrible way to, to that's like asking you know an er doctor well how many patients did you lose last year right that that's a a pretty bad way to to measure and so um being able to actually sort of assign a score based on number of, of uh, kind of vulnerabilities or exposures you have at each sort of level of, of severity, score that and then track your progress over time so that, you know, most, you know, most of us can't answer today, am I more secure than I was a week ago, a month ago, a year ago, right? I mean, we, we just can't. You can say, oh, we closed this many tickets, we deployed these new products, but it's really, really hard to to say for sure, oh yeah, I'm safer than I was. And so what you're really trying to answer is, is that question and apply some kind of repeatable metric to that so that you can have a good understanding of how you're, you're tracking over time. Well, and, Hope that answers that we, the question. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and when we look at that, you know, having that, that risk profile and understanding it is so important. And so when we look at the attack simulation tool set, if you will, um, what type of risks inside the network, DevOps, endpoints, are we reducing by having this simulation strategy in place? Can you give us some examples? Sure, sure. Um, you, know, you, you made a really good point uh, on your last question that much of the time security teams like only see a breach in the rearview mirror, right? And the reality is, most, like we we all talk about SOAR systems and we talk about security automation. There's actually very little kind of automated enforcement out there, right? I mean, uh, so really what you're trying to do at the end of the day is help your security teams be better, right? Your point was exactly right. Most security teams don't see what, don't know what an attack looked like until they're looking at it in the rearview mirror, a breach happens, then they're going back and looking at the logs and they go, oh, that's what that meant. That's what that was, right? So next time it happens, uh, next time it happens, they know, but now it's too late, right? Because you've been breached. And that's really, that's, you know, circling back to what kind of what is BAS and what does it do? By running those real attacks against your network, you can see what that attack looks like on your network, right? Exactly what the logs look like. You can tweak your SIM and get it to, to respond appropriately so that when it happens um you've seen it before you say oh i know what that is that's a log for shell attack that's wanna cry that's whatever it is uh and you've now you know you've now uh seen that so one of the so I, i'd say there's two broad categories of sort of risk that we're reducing one is just product misconfiguration and that definitely happens like i said the basic technology most firewalls are good. Most EDR, and there's a little more variation, I'd say, in, in EDR that, than in firewalls, but most of them are, are pretty good. Most of the time, and there's a great, I think like Gartner, you know, quote on this, that 99% uh, of firewall breaches are caused by misconfiguration, not by technology problems, right? So misconfiguration definitely happens. And there, <laughs> we, we all have, you know, we all have exposures sort of because uh, of that. So being able to just say, oh, I'm, you know, I just tested and my firewall is susceptible to a particular, I don't know, Internet, Internet Explorer memory corruption issue. But if I go to my firewall and I turn on blocking for X, Y, Z, then I'm protected. So that's kind of one category, right? And that, in some ways, that's sort of the low hanging fruit because 
those things are usually pretty easy to, you know, run a simulation. Oh, this got through. So I turn on some feature and now I'm safe. The second category goes back to the analyst question, the risk of having, especially a more kind of sophisticated multi-vector attack, which involves uh, correlating rules from lots of different security products to understand that's happening. The risk of the security team not knowing what those messages combined mean, not having maybe the SIM optimized to, to you know, send up a flare or whatever, that risk of long dwell time because you haven't detected something um, so that you can respond appropriately. That's the second, I think, big bucket of, of risk. Now, obviously that translates into lots of downstream things like data exfiltration and you know, losing your data to ransomware and things like that. But just in terms of the, sort of the upfront security exposure, those are the two buckets that I would, uh, I would sort of put this in. Well, that's a great point that our environments are very dynamic and they're, they're constantly changing. Configurations are constantly changing. The environment is constantly being modified. Um, and so when we look at, you know, validating security posture in real time, why is it important to conduct this type of activity? Uh, another great question. I mean, I, uh, I get asked a lot uh, actually about, you know, well, we're doing pen testing. So if I'm doing pen testing, do I need to do something else? Pen testing is great. It's not dynamic. It's typically like once or twice a year. And it gives you sort of a snapshot of what your security posture was January 18th and July 20th. Right. I mean, it, it's so it's this two little slices uh, in time. You could be totally secure today and not be secure tomorrow. Uh, and it may be because of changes you've intentionally made. It could be changes in the threat landscape. And I think, you know, the, the log for shell, log for J uh, uh, attacks, which kind of consumed lots of people's time over what would have otherwise been you know, kind of a, a holiday break. It's a good example of that. You can have new security on exposures on your network that have nothing to do with you, right? You, you, you may have done everything right. You kept your software up to date, you did all this, and boom, you've got this massive set of <laughs> almost unlimited vulnerability uh, on your network. That changes all the time. So if you did a pen test in November, it's not gonna tell you anything about that, right? So you really wanna be kind of validating your network, your protections, your defenses, your your you know security team at the rate of ransomware, or not just ransomware, but sort of malware development. So when there's a new threat, you know, optimally like that day, you run a test, you say, oh, I'm protected from this, I'm safe. And then when new variants come out tomorrow, you do the same thing. And so when your boss or you know his boss or you know her, the, the CEO at the top or the board member calls you and she says, hey, are we protected from X, Y, Z? You want to be able to say, yes, we are. And I know this because I tested today or no, we've got a gap there. And here are the, the mitigations that we're, uh, that we're taking. And that's, those are the kind of questions that you're going to get and, and certainly need to be able to answer. And so having that daily validation becomes really, really uh, important. Well, and you bring up a, a great point. For those of you that are on the call, if you have questions, please type that in chat. We're going to have a Q&A session towards the end here where Scott will be able to answer uh, additional questions about the technology. Um, but Scott, you definitely bring up a great point because on a regular basis, um, the board of directors, the CIO, the CEO want to know, could this be us? And so being able to run um, the, the conversation around like the, the log J4 situation and being able to tell, is that in our environment and could that be us and will we compromise is such a huge piece of that. And I would say that overwhelmingly with CISOs and CIOs that I've talked to and worked for, um, that's a big thing that gets asked. Um, like SecOps effectiveness, alert fatigue, how does something like this reduce the noise that that constant alert fatigue issue that happens in environments? Right, uh, great question. So, and that's a you know dealing with alert fatigue can be a very obviously broad uh, question. There are a couple of ways that you know that you can improve this, uh, and there are a couple that that you know 
there are a few that, that, that we help with. One of those, you know, I mentioned uh, earlier, like SIM optimization. So the reality is, you know, and I, I talked about like uh, product misconfiguration, firewall configuration, right? That's important. But most, you know, most organizations don't change like their firewall configuration daily or even weekly, right? Often it's monthly or quarterly, right? And there's a fairly uh, comprehensive change review process and change control board and things like that. And, and, and that's great. But where we do spend our time is SIM optimization, like writing and tweaking those SIM rules, uh, hopefully to help us find very quickly things that we need to pay attention to. That's a large, you know, kind of dawning task, right? And how do you know if you've gotten it right? How do you know if you've, you know, we all want to get rid of all these uh, alerts. So, you know, we look for things to sort of ignore or deprioritize. How do you know if you have just basically disabled or muted something that's really important? Well, one way to know that is by running, running, uh, running lots of attack simulations and by doing that, say, okay, I'm getting, you know, I know what to pay attention to, right? Like one of the things that, that, you know, we, we do in, uh, like in our, our, uh, product, we actually show you a ladder diagram of how each attack works. You know, this host talks to this host on this port and here's the data that's transmitted so that, uh, you know, you can help to like write those symbols and there's, you know, other examples out there, but, um, by doing that, you can kind of constantly improve your sim tuning and learn what to mute and what to pay attention to and actually validate that, right? So, you know, you can, if you have turned sort of the, the priority of something down and then you run a simulation and your sim misses it, you don't flag it, that means you should not have done that. You need to go back and, and roll that one back, right? And so that that's one way that you can help. Now that doesn't reduce sort of the inflow of alerts uh, or log messages really that are flowing into the SIM from your sort of dozens of security products, but it can certainly help you deal with those uh, in a much more manageable fashion and still be uh, kind of confident that you're gonna see important things, right? That you haven't turned down something uh, something important. Now, another way actually that, that we help um, uh, customers deal with that uh, we build a threat intelligence gateway called, called Threat Armor. We've got this big library of like tens of millions of sites that we validate every day that we know are bad. Um, these are sites that like there's no reason to ever let traffic to or from them onto your network, right? And so if you block those, you know, we found in production we can block up to 80% of the malicious connections um, that would otherwise generate SIM alerts. And I think like, you know, phishing sites, botnet controllers, you know, malware sites, things like that. Why even deal with those? Why, why waste kind of firewall resources and all that running stuff through a DPI engine? If like the site's bad anyway, right? You know, so if you can kind of screen out the low hanging fruit, then you can spend your time, you know, and, and your log messages on uh, important stuff. I guess, you know, the analogy I use is um, now, you know, kind of post 9-11, you go to the airport, you can only go to the gate if you've got a boarding pass. If you don't have a boarding pass, you're not like a legitimate traveler and they just block you there. So this is a way of kind of saying, oh, you're not a legitimate like piece of traffic. You have no business being here. So I'm not gonna put you through the x ray machines and all that stuff because you're not worth my time, right? And that way, you know, the security, you know, the TSA people can spend more time on actual travelers and, and, and look for bad stuff there. So those are two ways that you can think about sort of reducing alert fatigue is, you know, Optimization with confidence of the SIM itself combined with just a reduce and especially like perimeter uh, security gateway logs that are flowing in. And, and you make a great point about only having to really deal then with those types of incidents or those types of activities that um, are differentiated somehow or not that that white noise. When we look at use cases around um, examples of simulation strategy and how they were put in place and benefits. Can you provide us a couple of examples of different use cases of why organizations would put this technology in place and then what were the benefits of, of, of some of these? Sure. I mean, one, one example that, that sort of jumps out is um, we had a, a, a customer 
uh, actually in the, in the financial space, and they were going through a pretty significant update of the protection of their web services, right? Their um, kind of WAF deployment and, and things like that. And, you know, they had spent a lot of time configuring things and they thought everything was running fine. <laughs> when we ran, you know, and, and they, they brought us in to kind of validate things, they actually found that with their current configuration, they were basically blind to encrypted attacks, right? That uh, if something was happening in clear text, hey, they were great and everything was set up rightly. But once the attacks moved to, to TLS, which 99% of the time they will be, uh, the bulk of them got through, right? They just weren't seeing that uh, at all, right? And so that's, I mean, that's just one kind of example of, hey, we're safe. And, you know, the sales guy did a demo and everything looked great. And we saw that. And then we actually run like a, a realistic attack and turns out you're, you're missing it uh, completely. Another um, like really interesting, and it, it seems simple, but another thing that, that we found, a lot of times security tools fail silently, right? It's hard to tell the difference between not getting an alert from, especially in like a large distributed environment, it's hard to tell the difference between not getting an alert because nothing happened and not getting an alert because something is turned off or misconfigured, right? So one environment, you know, we, we were deployed and uh, we had, uh, you know, simulations, you know, attack simulations out at a particular like branch office location. Uh, and it was interesting, they didn't see, like back at the, the central sim, they didn't see alerting on this attack happening. But that's really weird, right? And it turns out that just the, the logging configuration uh, between that remote, you know, whatever, wherever the branch office was and the central site was misconfigured. So they weren't getting alert messages at all, right? Not just from us, but from anything that was happening, right? So lucky for, for the, the customer, it wasn't a real attack that was happening there, but had it been, they would have been completely blind because just that logging connection was broken. And that's, you know, as simple as it sounds, that's a really common kind of challenge, right? Is, oh, something happened and I missed it. I had a blind spot, right? Because of misconfiguration, because I didn't have sensors set up correctly. Uh, so that's a, a good thing. You know, that's another example of something uh, good to know. Uh, one other uh, example, um, and it's funny, like, there are really sophisticated ones. Oh, I didn't have blocking for a particular attack. You know, those are kind of, those are sort of obvious, but you know, thinking back to the sort of security analyst question, um, we like at a, at a customer site actually did, I think it was a WannaCry uh, simulation, right? And you think, oh, people are you know, set up to deal with this, been around for, for a while. Uh, and it was literally, you know, they saw the log messages from the, you know, on, on the SIM from the activity. And, you know, this guy's face kind of goes uh, pale. He goes, wait, I've seen that before. And went and looked, and sure enough, there was a host, you know, they, they saw the, uh, I guess, um, like SMB V1, you know, log messages on, on, the, on the firewall. Went and looked, and sure enough, they had been getting identical messages, again, out at a, at a, a, a particular site. Turned out there was actually an active WannaCry infection on a server at this site. They had just thought, oh, there's a misconfigured Windows box and it's, you know, sending out SMB messages. Yeah, we'll get to it someday, but it's low priority. But when they saw what a real attack looked like, like, holy cow, we've got this on our network. And they went and sure enough, there was an infected system. So, I mean, those are just uh, a couple of sort of off the cuff examples of where, you know, running, you know, running our, our tools, threat simulator, you know, the, these examples, running that in an environment and either finding something wrong, you know, with the configuration or with just kind of the general awareness level of the analyst team about what a real attack looks like on, on the network. Great point there about what a real attack looks like. Uh, a lot of uh, us in the industry have done red team, blue team activities. You know, we, we've taken, uh, put a bunch of folks in a conference room together and, 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 and run those types of drills. But responding to incidents really comes around muscle memory and, and, and the practice of actually seeing an attack occur. And, and can you talk a little bit about how that's benefited some of your customers? 
Yeah, well, and again, like red teaming is great. I mean, that, that's a, if you can sort of afford to have full-time, you know, red team, blue team, that's awesome, right? And that's, um, you know, that's kind of a hallmark of a fairly robust kind of secure cybersecurity organization, right? But it's expensive and it takes a lot of time to uh, develop. Um, where I think there's a huge kind of unmet sort of need in the market is there are a lot of customers out there who for various reasons don't have, can't afford that kind of full-time red team, right? I mean, that's, that's a lot of money that you're spending every year on, yeah, it's, it's security and, and that's a great thing, but it can be hard to argue that, you know, those 10 hacker expensive hackers that you've hired are directly kind of contributing to business return. Right. And so sort of justifying that can be difficult. Now, you know, if you're kind of a too big to fail bank, sure. You got, you got the, the funding for that, but a lot of people uh, don't. And so, you know, what, like one of the things that we've really tried to set out to do is to help customers who don't have that kind of like funding level, frankly, to, to do a full-time red team, still enjoy most of the benefits, right? You know, of running, you know, all these tests and doing it in a really comprehensive, exhaustive, repeatable manner. So you can kind of track your progress over time and say, yeah, we spent, you know, X amount on this threat simulator product, a lot less than, you know, hiring a full-time person. And over the last six months or a year or whatever, look, how much our risk went down. Like, look at all the improvements we've made, look how many critical vulnerabilities and gaps we, we've closed. And so, again, I'm not, I would never argue against red teaming or pen testing or anything like that, but making those benefits available to a lot more people in a, a cost-effective way, I think is a really, um, that's a very solid goal, right, that, that we set out. And, and so I'm very, I'm, I'm pretty proud of the progress kind of we, we've made in that direction. And so many organizations that that red team event is a single point in time or snapshot in time. It's once a quarter, maybe it's once or twice a year. It might be a requirement of cybersecurity insurance. And and like you said, it's a, a large investment in resources and time and then in the environment. Um, you can't necessarily red team in your production environment. Maybe not a great idea. Um, definitely can create some challenges with production and being able to you know, actually function for your customers. Um, so when we look at these types of environments, how hard is it to set up and maintain a simulation environment and what time, staff, and resources are required uh, as far as a continuing investment to set something up like this? So it's a, it's a good question. Um, I think the answer is going to be very sort of vendor dependent frankly, right? I mean, and we've seen, you know, there are solutions in the market which are kind of typically packaged with like a very large services engagement, you know, like along with like managed incident response, maybe, you know, kind of outsource security management, some things like that, which are typically a fairly heavy lift. Um, and part of the offering may actually be sort of sourcing that as a service, you know, you're paying people to come in and set it up and, and manage it and, and, and things like that. Um, you know, in some cases you have to install management software and keep that, you know, kind of up and running. Um, there are typically with, with, I think any region attack simulation, uh, solution, there are going to be some software endpoints like in and around your, your network, because you, in order to keep this safe, you want to make sure that you're you know, when you send malware across the network, it's not going to sort of a live Windows endpoint, you know, where, where it could bust loose and, and do something bad. Or when you're conducting a SQL injection attack, you want to go through the real WAF, but you don't want to hit actual, you know, port 443 on your production web server, right? And so there's going to be some software agents spread across your network. Um, and that's going to take, you know, some amount of time. now. Our approach was to, um, and you know, speaking for us, not as the market in general, our approach first was to go, uh, go for uh, sort of very rapid deployment. So we made the choice to do like SaaS management first, right? And kind of follow on later with, with, with on-prem, 
So you don't have to load any management software, right? It's just there, you log into your secure cloud portal and, and, and you're uh, up and running. Similarly, like in an attack, there, there's typically you know, two or more uh, endpoints involved. There's the attacker and the victim, right? Um, with some solutions, you're installing both of those. Um, again, with ours, uh, we actually maintain the attackers out in what we call the dark, you know, cloud. Uh, that's just our name, but the dark cloud where we run the attackers. So you don't have to worry about managing those, right? Um, so again, that's, you know, that was our design decision because we wanted to kind of focus on rapid deployment, but um, that's going to vary somewhat by vendor. And if you're looking at, you know, vast tools, that's probably something that like you want to ask and, and consider is, what do I have to install? How hard is it to update the software? How hard it is, is it to load new updates? Things like that. How often do I have to update the endpoints or are they self-updating? All of those kind of questions you'll want to ask the vendor that you're looking at and you'll see a pretty broad range, I think, of, of answers. So it's hard to give sort of a global answer. It is gonna vary a lot by kind of who, who you're talking to. Well, I think you make a great point because there's an investment in these kinds of strategies from a staffing perspective, a resource perspective, and then, you know, just continued investment. When we look specifically at the key site technology, and this is where I want to dive a little bit into your specific technology, how is that different mm -hmm. in your platform and what are the resources required to manage and maintain it over time? I'm you know, look to evaluate the product, um, put it in my environment, but I have a really small staff. Um, so those resources and that cost and that continued investment is super important. Right, so like I said, we made the, the choice and um, we made the choice first to do SaaS, right? Which means you don't have to maintain the management stuff at all, the attacking sides at all. You just deploy um, the, the endpoint agents in your network, which are, you know, and, and one of the benefits there is things like software updates, threat intelligence updates, which happen now like every single day, those are all automatic. You don't have to do any uh, of that, right? I mean, it's in the cloud, you just get the benefits and don't do um, like any other work, right? So it's, you know, I don't know, you can probably get like up and running in probably like half an hour and then depending on the number of like different offices where you want, like think about different security zones in your network. If you're concerned about things like lateral movement, you will typically want uh, like an agent per zone. So if you want to say, oh, can a piece of malware move from this zone to another, and then you've got some kind of enforcement point in the middle, you know, a, a firewall or, or whatever, and that's what you're validating, you'll want to have an agent per security zone. So you figure, you know, a couple of minutes, I don't know, per agent to get kind of things uh, up and running. You know, most deployments, you know, worst case, kind of a couple of hours, you're, you're, you're sort of up and running. And then it's just a matter of setting up your schedules for assessments and, and things like that. I mean, we, we try to make it pretty easy. Now you did, you asked about um, technology as, as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with, um, Keysight, uh, this technology actually came from a company called Ixia and a, a you know, subordinate company, Breaking Point, where we've been doing traffic generation and attack generation for a long time, since like 2005, I guess, right? So we've got a long history in this space of doing like firewall testing and DPI engine testing and realistic application generation and, and things like that. Um, and we leverage that same technology in this in threat simulator in our breach and attack simulation product so when we generate attacks it's not like a it's not a pcap replay right we're actually we've got native you know we've got a tcp stack basically that's doing realistic you know stateful generation of traffic and can adapt to different network environments and things like that and so that's where a lot of our you know kind of investment is is on that very, very realistic, you know, not just replayed, so it looks a little different every time, um, threat simulation, and also on the threat intelligence that feeds it, right? Because that's, you know, sort of once the agents are built, the real value in the network is 
how realistic and how up to date is the threat intelligence that you're feeding in, right? That that information about what are the new attacks and things like that. And so that's um that's a that's a big focus for us. Now that doesn't take the user any extra time, right? I mean, like I said, it's auto updating. So you don't have to, even though there's new threat until every day, you don't have to do anything. It's just there. And so you run your assessments every day and you get to leverage it. Um, I don't know, I hope, hope that answered the, the question. Oh, absolutely. So Francesca, uh, we wanted to check and see if there are any questions from our environment. Looks that are on the line. Uh, yeah, we do have one that came in at just about 1130 and forgive me if you've already um, reviewed them in your discussion. How many of the sites um, would be catched by default by blocking geolocations external to the US? Okay, I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part of the question. I, I caught the geolocation part, but I missed the first part of the question. Could you repeat? How many of the sites would we catch by default by blocking geolocation external to the US? Oh, I'm sorry. So that, that probably goes back to the threat intelligence gateway uh, question, threat armor. Current percentage, boy, I, you know, I do not know that varies uh, a lot. Um, actually, but per, if you just looked at straight percentage, there are a lot of large network ranges. No, th this varies over time, uh, but which have basically been uh, hijacked. You know, there's a lot of sort of BGP route hijacking out there. And so on a strict numeric basis, counting number of IP addresses, not all of those, but just statistically, a lot of those are outside the US. So a sizable chunk, you know, it might be as much as half, uh, just because of kind of you know BGP route hijacking are going to be non-US. Now that that's going to change sometimes, uh, you know, obviously on a daily basis, um, and so it's uh, it's hard to give an exam, uh, exact. I would say roughly half because of that. Now for other sites, you know, malware, phishing, things like that, uh, it's all over the board, and it's it's interesting. You'll see even on a daily basis based on what campaigns uh, are active, whether it's you know botnet campaigns or, or something else, and who they're targeting, right? Different APTs will target often different verticals in different regions, right? So we'll see a burst for a couple of days of maybe some particular, particular campaign ransomware, something that's going after US financials. And then we'll see something going after healthcare organizations in Western Europe. And then we'll see something in I don't know, Latin America. And so when you see that, you'll, um, because of people doing strict geo-based blocking, you know, you'll see a lot of times the, you know, kind of hackers take over some set of IPs. They might be cloud, they might uh, not be, but like within the geographic region, like if you look back at SolarWinds, right? That, that was a good example where the, you know, Purportedly, uh, Russians would send, you know, the communication from kind of the, the corrupt software updates or part of the, uh, you know, Orion platform would, were all talking to basically, you know, controllers in the same country. And that made, A, it made the connections look a little less suspicious than if they were, you know, the connections were going back to like Russia or Ukraine or like you know, Eastern Europe or somewhere. Uh, and also that got around the geo blocking rule. So I know that was a long winded answer. It's going to be hard to give an exact, you know, answer and it's going to change on a daily basis. But just statistically, I'd say the kind of BGP hijacking often outweighs numerically the other sites. And so probably half or a little more. Hope, hope, okay. hope that was in, in some way helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, what's the difference between breach and attack, uh, breach and attack simulation and penetration testing? Okay, good question, and and probably the the single most common question that we get. Um, so, in penetration testing, you're typically the attacking team is typically doing sort of everything they anything and everything they can to get in. 
as different from maybe red teams. Red teams often will try to emulate a particular APT and use the you know tactics and techniques and procedures that a particular uh, attacker would use. Um, penetration testing is typically once or twice a year, right? It's a fairly comprehensive, uh, uh, extensive process versus precision attack simulation, which ideally you run, you know, every every day because there there's new malware uh, every day. Um, pen testing, good pen testers, a I'll tell you, will almost always get in, right? Given enough time, kind of enough money, they'll typically find their way in. Penetration testing also has a different focus most of the time, right? Pen testing is not trying to be exhaustive. It's not trying to test every defensive mechanism that uh, that you have in place. Um, but a good pen tester will go for things like um, social engineering. Who is your CFO? And, oh, the CFO has kids that play on a soccer team. Oh, and the, what's the name of the soccer team? Okay, it's the, you know, the Thunderbolt. And so, and who's the coach of that soccer team? And they'll, you know, figure this out on social media. And then they'll send an email to the CFO, spoof, looks like, looks like it's from the coach with, oh, here's the, you know, here's the Gatorade and donut schedule for the season. And the CFO opens that and gets like something bad on their laptop and that's their way in. Um, or do something like uh, pull up in an unmarked van in the office parking lot, try to hack their way onto Wi-Fi, right? Now, those are great tests. It, it, they're, they're good to know, you know, and, and it's great for hardening your defenses, but that's very different from doing kind of a comprehensive, exhaustive, repeatable, sort of daily um, scan assessment of all of your, you know, perimeter and endpoint defenses to look for sort of daily drift and daily updates that you might need to make. Um, so I would certainly say they're, they're complementary. Uh, breach and attack simulation is going to give you, again, a more comprehensive and, you know, repeatable and daily update. Again, the pen testing team in January, probably going to find something different from what the team in July finds. But in both cases, the team is going to, you know, probe your network until they find their way in and then they're in and they're going to do their thing and they're going to stop looking for new ways in, right? So it's not as uh, exhaustive a, a survey of your uh, of your defenses. Good question. Great, great, great. That's awesome. How long does it typically take to get up and running? Oh yeah. So I, I think I, I largely um, uh, answered that. The um, it's going to vary by product. I'd say in our case. You know, you get a basic deployment up and running in you know half an hour, and then um, you know maybe a, it'll sort of a couple of days total to get you know decide what schedule you want and uh, and things like that. If you have deployments at a lot of branch offices, you know you've just got the got to get the software installed there. Honestly, in many cases, deciding where, like how many really, you know, you have to ask yourself a lot of questions in order to get a, a good security testing program in place. Like how many security zones do I have? What, where am I worried about sort of lateral movement, you know, from the data center to the cloud, from remote users to the, to, to the corporate network, from there to the cloud and making sure that you have, um, uh, like kind of agents installed at all of the right places so that wherever you have enforcement points, you can validate those. Figuring that out is often a longer process than any software installation. And that's, again, that's going to vary based on sort of has the, has the customer, has the security team considered that question before of where is their exposure? Where are the possible paths kind of through their network for for bad stuff to get from from here to there, right? Uh, again, that that decision making process can be uh, longer than any uh, software installation. Uh, and I have a, another question. As we look at you know the constant fight for technology and tools and budgeting are always always big challenges and and getting the CIO or the CFO to be able to invest in some of these tools. You know, the, the big question is, is, you know, how do I get my my boss to pay for this? And so when we talk about value uh, to organizations from training for incidents, 
How do these tools prepare organizations for incident response? And where's the business value associated with the cost for some of these tools? Uh, great question, great question. So um, in many cases, sort of one way to look at it is you're making a new investment in X. Maybe you're going through a firewall vendor transition, you know, going from brand A to, to brand B. The defaults are different. The configuration is different. The behavior is different. If you actually want to validate that this new box is set up correctly and that you're getting the most value out of it, that's a great opportunity to sort of add, you know, a BAS deployment sort of to that project. Because, you know, as we've all seen, yeah, you know, whatever firewall you've just picked, there are people out there with exactly that firewall and probably at your kind of skill level who were breached because of something something that was set up wrong or something that they didn't see or understand. You don't want to be that person, right? And so by running BAS, uh, you know, running breach and attack simulation, you can validate that all your configuration is right and that you know what attacks look like and you can, um, you know, you can respond appropriately. Similarly, like I, the example I mentioned earlier, you're moving from an on-prem uh, web services deployment to the cloud, you're transitioning vendors, that's another good place. Um, you, there's also a really valid uh, way to think about this from a kind of staff training and, and development and retention capability. You know, security analysts are not cheap uh, and they're not cheap because they're not easy to find, right? There are hundreds of thousands more open kind of IT security jobs than we have people for, right? So you really want to train and improve the people that you have, right? And like, why would you go and do a long search to try to pull somebody in if you can sort of train and develop the people that you already have? And by, rather than, you know, sending people off to a lot of training classes and, and things like that, where they get cer certainly experience, but it's the experience that they then have to adapt to their own environment. If you frequently use a uh, breach and attack simulation tool, those people every day get experience with optimizing firewall, optimizing the SIM, understanding what attacks look like, improving their responses, doing you know playbook testing, all of that. And so you're constantly like improving your own internal um, skill set, right? So those are, and you know when you look at it, um, I think from either of those perspectives, it's a really small investment relative to the risk of either a breach, a preventable breach that you could have stopped had you simply taken the time to, to play one what if scenario. Oh, what if I get hit by this particular attack? Can I stop it? Can I detect it? Can I respond? Um, or having frequent turnover in your security staff, which again, leaves you blind or short staffed or unable to deal with that, you know, the alert fatigue that, that we talked about earlier. Well, you know, I think you bring up that great point of having that repeatable activity where your staff have a chance to be able to see these events occurring in real time and be able to learn to respond because it helps them see, oh, I've seen that before. Um, you know, Scott, this was super useful for me as a cybersecurity professional. You know, I'm always looking for tools and different ways to be able to help create a layered defense strategy that's um, dynamic. So uh, this attack simulation area is an area uh, definitely that is growing and super interesting. So I want to thank you so much for participating uh, this afternoon in this conversation and helping provide information to our guests about kind of what does it take to get involved in it and um, what it is that's important to be able to drive and leverage value for the organization. And so Francesca, um, if you'd like to wrap it up with uh, how people can get more information about this type of technology. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you again, Scott and Keysight. They're one of our, our very valued partners um, to Trace3. We will be following up with each of you. Um, we'll be sending you uh, some information on how to reach out to both Stephanie and Scott for any additional questions or if you'd like to uh, explore Trace3 services with, with Keysight any further. Um, in the meantime, uh, once again, I want to thank you all for uh, participating and uh, joining us for today's 
webinar. Um, I guess that's really about it. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Scott and Keysight. Yeah, Stephanie, Prince, Jessica, thank you very much. And everyone who attended, thank you very much for your time. Hope this was useful. And again, if you have questions, please let us know. We'd be, uh, we'd be happy to follow up. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. All right. Thanks. Cheers. Bye.